Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. Hey! Hey! <laughs> that sounded vaguely aggressive. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yoo-hoo! Hello, hello. I didn't mean to sound so aggressive. We've got, um, we've got an interesting show today. Just you and me for the first half. And... Um, and then it will be uh, me and two lovely women who have uh, come to talk about an organization I had never heard of. And I've asked other people in the last week, do you know of this organization? And everybody says, no, no, no. Oh, and this is an organization whose profile deserves to be upped substantially. So we're going to uh, do our part in uh, facilitating that. It's called Amachi Pittsburgh. And it is an organization that tends to the needs of the children of prisoners, people who are incarcerated. It's something we don't think about. Somebody gets sent to jail. What happens to their children? What happens to the kids? So it's a, it's a, it's a big issue that doesn't get a lot of attention, and, uh, ah, uh, okay, I just wanted to, this just in, and I wanted to say it, uh, Bridget Matthews Lee, you know who you are, Bridget Matthews Lee, happy birthday, she's 98 years old today, wow. isn't that great? And uh, your, your niece sent that in to me. Uh, so thank you. Be glad to uh, wish her a very, very happy birthday. Well, guys, welcome. It's a Monday. It's the 10th of February. And uh, there's got lots of little things here. Just a, a sort of a... A look back at the story we told you about uh, the WTAE report about a uh, Southside auto repair shop um, and what has happened to its employees because of Obamacare. This is literally falling apart here. Um, and we took great issue with that report and saw it as what it was, which was a piece of propaganda perpetrated on a uh, unsuspecting audience or a trusting audience uh, by WTAE and uh, Wendy Bell. And to show how egregious this was, it has been, I did mention, that it has been picked up. That little piece of propaganda was so beautifully done that it was picked up. I am going, I'm looking at the Twitter feed from John Boehner. I'm looking at his picture. He tweeted, he sent the whole story out on his Twitter feed. I can't even begin to imagine how many followers he has. And... He said this, premiums rise 32%, co-pays double at Pennsylvania repair shop as a result of Obamacare. And then he sends Wendy Bell's video. Keith Rothfuss, Twitter feed. There he is. He sends the same thing out. Only he says Pennsylvania small business employee says there's nothing affordable about it. I can't afford it. Representative Mike Kelly tweets Wendy's story out. This story says Representative Kelly from Western PA cements the fact <laughs> that people's lives are being changed for the worse by Obamacare. So. The fact that that story stood out <laughs> is not, it, it didn't just stand out to me. It didn't just stand out to uh, Aaron Neinhauser, who came on the show via telephone to uh, talk about all the misleading and misinformation in it. But 
the powers that be in the Republican Party jumped on this baby because this. They couldn't have. If they had done a propaganda piece themselves, they couldn't have done better. So, Wendy, sure, I don't know what your party affiliation is, but, dear, you have become the darling of the grand old party. God. And to another scurrilous attack on Republicans, I mean by Republicans, on President Obama. Their latest thing, you know, what they, they fasten onto stuff that is either incorrect and or unimportant and or totally totally falsified to the point where it bears no resemblance to the truth. And what their one of their latest things now is calling Obama a dictator, an imperial president, somebody who is flouting the Constitution. Why, I believe that a newspaper that emanates right out of this city itself, the Pittsburgh Tribune Review yesterday, in an editorial, suggested, just came a little short of saying impeach him, but did end its editorial saying something to the effect it is potentially an impeachable offense. The offense? Issuing executive orders. Because the Congress will not cooperate with this president at all, uh, the president has, as in as much as he can constitutionally, uh, done a little, you know, little bit of fine-tuning here, a little bit of a something there, and he is, whatever he can do all by himself, he's doing. And the repubs are going nuts. This egregious abuse of authority, this unconstitutional and potentially impeachable offense. So, Charles Blow in the New York Times helpfully did some research, and starting from the first president of these United States, that would be George Washington, all the way up to the current president of the United States, that would be Barack Obama, he tells us how many executive orders those presidents from Washington to Obama issued. And do you know what? Oh, this is a shocker, seeing as Republicans are acting like nothing like this has ever happened before. Barack Obama isn't even in the top 10. I don't know that he's in the top 20. I haven't done all the... He's not even... Okay, Barack Obama has issued, at this point in his presidency, which is five years, 168 executive orders. Now, let's see. Ronald Reagan, let's take him. 381. Why he should have been impeached? Were the Democrats asleep at the switch? Why Ronnie disregarded the legislative branch and just by fiat was issuing executive orders? My God, more than twice as many. Nixon, 346. Clinton, 364. George Bush, 291. Remember, Obama, 168. Teddy Roosevelt, 1,081 executive orders. Who do you think he was, King Tut? Teddy Roosevelt, over 1,000. Barack Obama hasn't even hit 200. But he's a despot! And if you watch Fox News and listen to the right-wing radio, you would think that Barack Obama is doing something that has never been done before. Yeah, in a way he is. He's being extraordinarily discreet 
discreet about how often he uses this awesome power. FDR, ladies and gentlemen, how many executive orders? Granted, he had more years than anybody else, but get this, 3,552. Calvin Coolidge, that staunch, silent Republican. Cal. What did Cal do with executive orders? Oops. 1,203. This is, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on. It's, again, a discomforting reality that Republicans, um, well, obviously have a lot of difficulty with, which is fact. <laughs> fact instead of fantasy. But anyone who listens to the blatherings of Boehner and all the others uh, and the talk jocks about how the, this Obama is just running roughshod over the Constitution of the United States, acting by fiat. Who does he think he is, Vladimir Putin? Well, they've got everything but fact on their side. Everything but fact. Sick of them. Okay, big news today. University of Missouri football player, Michael Sam, who's a hell of a football player. He's first team All-American, All-Defensive Player of the Year in the Southeastern Conference, uh, which is a hell of a conference. Uh, Missouri's most valuable player, voted by the players there. He came out and said, I'm gay. Now, this is a first. This is a first because this guy is believed to be good enough that he's going to go in probably the third round of the upcoming draft. He's graduating this in a few weeks, I guess. And he's now being applauded because he would be the first. He would be the first NFL player to openly declare his sexual orientation. The fact that he is doing it before any NFL team chooses him suggests that he's truly fearless because a lot of people think that some teams won't touch him now. He, and if you think that's crazy, because I saw Jess gave me a look like, oh, come on, come on. But get this. He played uh, last month in the uh, game that college seniors play so the scouts can get a, another look at them. And Mr. Uh, Sam, Michael Sam's agent, said he was asked more than once about whether or not he had ever seen Michael with a girl or if he had a girlfriend. So the scouts were on to the fact, because he was open about it with his teammates. So they knew they'd heard the whispering that this guy's gay. And so a scout for an NFL team, not just a, more than one scout, just last month was asking this guy's agent if, in fact, does he have a girlfriend, by the way? You ever seen him with a woman? Well, now they don't have to ask that question because Michael Sam has answered it. So he would be a first, openly gay, while playing in the NFL. This is a courageous young man. And lest you think he's not, get this. Somebody has already put out there. Let me find it. Oh, I printed it out. Did you, did you get me something? I did, but... You did? Yes, you did. Yeah. But it wouldn't print. Oh, yeah, there it is. All right. Speaking anonymously to Sports Illustrated, an NFL 
executive said the following. Sports Illustrated is reporting this. This is an executive with the National Football League. Quote, I don't think football's ready for an openly gay player. He didn't say openly gay player. He probably said a faggot or something just yet. In the coming decade or two, it's going to be acceptable. But at this point in time, it's still a man's man game. To call somebody a fag is still so commonplace. It had chemically imbalance an NFL locker room. It would chemically imbalance an NFL locker room. That, the words of a nowhere near as courageous human being as Mr. Sams, an NFL executive who refused to have his name attached to these words. Also, another anonymous longtime NFL scout said, quote, there is no question that his announcement will make teams less apt to select him in April's draft. And another executive with the NFL said it's going to take, quote, one confident GM or head coach with really firm job security to take him. So, if you didn't think he was courageous, you now know. Courageous. Wow. Okay. Um, And, don't know if you saw Woody Allen's long defense, his side of the story, printed in Sunday's New York Times. That's all him. No, it's not. Down to here. There it is. All that. And it ends with this. This piece will be my final word on this entire matter, and no one will be responding on my behalf to any further comments on it by any party. Enough people have been hurt. Well, I got to tell you something. I think he makes an extraordinarily compelling case (laughs) for his side of the story, much more so than the other side. And after reading it, and you know I'm no fan. I'm a fan of many of his films. I am no fan of his, nor have I ever been. I'll acknowledge his genius. But this is one hell of a defense and reads totally sincerely and it makes sense. It makes sense. And it throws the ball right back into Mia Farrow's lap. Um, I just, I asked Jess when I came in if she had read this and she said yes, she had just read it today and she had the same. Yeah, yeah. Same reaction I did. Yeah. I think Woody's being uh, falsely accused. I really do. I really do. And I wasn't expecting to think that. But I do recommend it to you if you have not read it. It's a, it's a hell of a job. All right, the most outrageous story today, the one that just freaks me out, is the story of the giraffe in the Copenhagen Zoo. Oh, my God. This glorious animal. He's just two years old. He wasn't even reached his full height. They, at the zoo, blew him away with a blast from a bolt gun. And then they invited children and anyone else who was interested to watch them slice open this glorious, now dead animal and feed him to the lions at the zoo. And there's this picture I saw, and there's little kids standing there looking Mm -hmm. as he's being chopped up. My God. 
The zoo, in its defense, has said they were merely following the recommendation of the European Association of Zoos, which said, yeah, put them down, put them down. You know why? Because, well, they have too many of his kind in the, in the captive gene pool. In other words, you don't want, and I understand, I mean, from a certain point of view, I understand this. Okay, they want to make sure that the captive giraffe gene pool does not um, become so, uh, what is it, yeah, yeah, sort of monotone. I can't think of the friggin' word. Um, they, it, it would result in essentially inbreeding, right, which would damage the strength of. But it, 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 I just can't believe. And, I mean, people were saying, I'll take them. Some gazillionaire said, I'll give you, like, almost a million dollars. Just give them to me. And the zoo said, no, 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 no. That just ain't going to work. They're very social animals. You can't have just one. And that might be true, too. And then, on the other hand, in the wild, which is something this poor animal never knew, he was born in captivity, in the wild, giraffes get killed all the time by lions, I think, who would then, yeah, eat them. But there's something about a zoo doing this to a healthy animal that is, it just feels so extraordinarily wrong and unpalatable and makes you just want to scream. Uh oh. Happy birthday! But uh, to the lady who who's ninety seven, not ninety eight. Oh, she's just a mere babe then. I wouldn't have even said anything if I knew she was ninety seven and not ninety eight, and that her nephew and not her niece sent that little reminder in. But because uh, I aim to be the anti Republican talk radio host, which is to say, I like to deal in facts. I just wanted to correct it. Oh, man. All right. Here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. The saddest story, sadder than the giraffe story that's out there today is. Well, I'll read the first sentence in the story I read. Sort of says a mouthful. It's come to this. The children of Martin Luther King Jr. are at war over his Nobel Peace Prize. The two sons, his namesake and Dexter King, have gone to court suing their sister Bernice King because she right now has the actual prize, the medal, the peace prize, and they want it. And they also want one of his personal Bibles. They say they both, by rights, and legally, belong to the corporation that was set up after, I guess, their mother's death to handle all of the stuff. Bernice says she will not give them either because she said it is their intent, and she knows it, to sell them, to get as much money for them as they can. I'll just say this, a longtime friend of the king's is quoted as saying, if there is such a thing as people turning over in their graves, then both Dr. King and Mrs. King are twirling in theirs. 
This is just the latest in a series of unbelievably sad, depressing reports of the inability of Dr. King's heirs to honor, to honor him. The mismanagement of their father's extraordinary legacy is reaching proportions that are just mind-boggling. And it's just amazing that there couldn't be some measure of mediation that somebody could provide because this is so, so appalling. And apparently since the oldest daughter, Yolanda, died a few years back, this, this warfare between the two sons and the surviving daughter has just gotten crazy, crazy. It's so sad. Margaret writes about Mr. Sam, the gay football player. I will buy his jersey no matter what team he goes to. So Margaret, a Steeler fan, says she will wear Sam's jersey if He's a raven, or if he's a Bran, or a Bengal, or an Oakland Raider, or any of those teams we love to hate. And you know what? I'm with her. What a courageous guy. And make no mistake, I mean, a lot of players are writing things now saying, you know, given what a locker room is like. This guy is going to have a tough time. Everybody's saying it. So he is truly a courageous man. First, first person in his family to ever graduate from college. Uh, comes from a family of like eight, nine children. A family that was poor, that... It was a rough, rough childhood. I believe two of his siblings are in prison, another's dead. I mean, it's just one of those hard scrabble, hard luck, tough, and yeah. So I think he's capable of handling it. That's my guess. Because nothing empowers you more than truth. And nothing weakens you more than lies. It's, it's a given. It's a given. The other story that I can't deal with um, is the murder of the two sisters. It, it just is one of those things that just makes you, it makes you sick. Apparently two lovely women, young women, by my my criteria. And I, I can see the police seem pretty flummoxed, which is upsetting. But somehow these two were forced down into their basement and shot in the head each. I mean, that is just Nothing apparently taken, although the cops I know are sitting on a lot of information, but it's just that lives can just bang, disappear. They apparently were, it made national news. I saw there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal about it. And one of the reasons it's making national news is because one of their, they come from a big family too of eight, and their eldest sister is um, a state legislator in Iowa. And so the headline reads, you know, legislators 
two sisters murdered in Pittsburgh. All right. Well, so that's some of the stuff that's been on my mind. And, of course, the Olympics. And I don't know if you're watching them, but there's some really good stuff to watch there. And I do recommend them. If only because you find out there's all these things that you really don't, that people spend their lives readying themselves for and becoming one of the best in the world. And, you know, they don't get any attention except every four years like this. And the skill required is just unbelievably mind-blowing. And the courage, too, or recklessness, as the case may be. But wow. I mean, I don't understand anyone who says, eh, I'm not in the baby. How do you not want to watch the best in the world do what they do? Whether you, you know, understand the sport or not, how do you not get hooked? on that so all right well I'll tell you what let's get a break out of the way let's bring our guests in and uh, get serious here okay because we're going to prison when we come back after this to Lynn at pghcitypaper.com or call Lynn at 412-316-3381. Lynn Cullen Live will return in a moment. Join One Billion Rising Pittsburgh for a global day of festive resistance to end violence against women. One billion women assaulted and raped worldwide is an atrocity. One billion people dancing to end violence is a revolution. We will rise on V-Day, February 14th, 12 to 2 p.m., Market Square www.1billionrisingpgh.org Strike, dance, rise. I'm Dr. John Chips. And I'm Dr. Tim Chips. We have a family dental practice that's been in business for over 35 years. We have two locations in the North Hills. No insurance? No problem. We have a new patient special that includes an exam, cleaning, and x-rays for just $99. Find Chips Dental on the web. Remember, Chips Dental. BurgBargains.com is the best bet for great Valentine's Day deals. Log on today for exclusive deals from your favorite local restaurants like Burger, Harris Grill, Verde, Pittsburgh Grill Downtown, and Willow. Sign up for the weekly email update for your chance to win a $100 gift card from this weekly spa. The all-new BurgBargains.com, Pittsburgh's best bargains, BurgBargains.com. Have a question or an opinion? Call Lynn Cullen at 412-316-3381 or email lynn at pghcitypaper.com. Now, more with Lynn Cullen Live. Hello! Are we back? Yes, we are. Hello! Welcome back. And um, you're not going to see me as much because I'm going to make way on the screen for these much more attractive women to my uh, left here. But uh, at the moment, we're all sort of cozied up. These two are part of an amazing organization that, and I told you this earlier in the hour, that I would like to help raise its profile because it's doing such extraordinary work. Um, these women are Anna Hollis who's right next to me here, who is, your position is the executive director, yes. executive director of Amachi Pittsburgh, and one of the um, employees, yet, <laughs> is uh, Kayla Boyer here. But Kayla was a recipient of mm -hmm. the program yes. initially. <laughs> Yeah. Um, maybe if we tell your story right off the bat, we'll get a sense of what Amachi <laughs> okay. does. Okay, so when did Amachi come into your life, Kayla? Okay, um, I was about 14. I okay. Think. So I was matched with a mentor through Amachi Pittsburgh um, in 2004. Uh, my mentor's name was Yolanda. Um, she was my mentor for three years. And you were matched? Because? I was matched with a mentor through Amachi because I had a parent who was incarcerated. It was my mother. Okay. And that's, um, that's how I became involved in Amachi. So Amachi comes into people's lives when they find themselves without a parent mm -hmm. because of incarceration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I actually matched Kayla. <laughs> 
Yes. You, I matched her, yeah, with uh, Yolanda. Yolanda was a member of my church. And um, so years later, you know, I was um, looking for an intern through Public Allies. And I didn't even put the name <laughs> with the face, but I, yeah. you know, I had this awesome resume for Kayla Boyer and called her in for an interview. And then she walks in the office and she actually saw her picture of her and her mentor on our desk. Yeah. <laughs> we still had her picture posted. So after you were in this precarious position, because when a child loses a parent in that manner for whatever length of time, that child becomes I would think extraordinarily vulnerable in many ways to all kinds of problems. Oh, yeah. um, and so having a mentor, were you aware when you were 14, 15, how important that was to you? Uh, back then, I didn't, I, I wasn't aware of how important it was. I right. mean, she was just a person who came to my house. We spent time together. We had lots of fun. And at that moment, I wasn't thinking about her stepping into that position as a mentor to just be another another support system and to be a positive role model. Mm -hmm. um, looking back on it now, I can see that she was a great mentor. She understood what her roles were. Um, but I can appreciate it much more now looking back on it and now working at Amachi. I, I, I can appreciate it. So you end up not only doing fine, you, you, did you go to college? I did. I went what? to Carlo University. Okay, and you majored in? Communications. Communications. We'll see how well I do. <laughs> so far you're doing very well. <laughs> the pressure. And as a matter of fact, I know, come to think of it, I, my job might be in some jeopardy here. <laughs> so you graduate. From, I mean, was this in the, do you think you would have gone to college and everything without Amachi? Do you have any sense of that? Would your path had I think been different? Well, I still had a lot of support at home from my grandmother, um, who always gave me that extra push. Mm -hmm. So I knew at some point I would, I would go to college. You did. But having another adult who believed in me, it also helped. Is your mother still incarcerated? She's not incarcerated at the moment. Okay. I see her from time to time. Uh, we don't have a very strong relationship, but we're working on that. Is there a father in the picture? No. No. All right. And Kayla's brother was matched, too, actually with Yolanda's husband. Yes. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, a different outcome for him. Really? So, yeah. Yes. It's, yeah, I think it's a lot tougher on boys. Um, yeah, it's, um, he, had a, he had a real hard time. Yeah, he had, he had a really hard time. Uh, he, he was also struggling with mental illness. Mm. Um, so he, he needed a lot of additional support. And, it, um, and so when you think of two children growing up in the same household, raised by the same parent, um, and we go on two completely different yeah. different paths, um, that's what we need to work on. Why do programs like Amashi work for some children and not for others? Mm -hmm. So we need to focus on children like my brother who needed additional support, additional help, and guidance. And, and didn't a mentor wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to look at the bigger picture, Anna. Um, what? <laughs> the need for this kind of a program. I don't think we ever think, you know, you might see in the paper, oh, this person got convicted and they're going to jail. And you feel, oh, we're all safer now because they, and you don't think that person has, has, kids. A, has children, yeah. has, yeah. Th there's a whole family mm -hmm. whose lives have been Right. thrown into disarray. Yeah, and there's so much shame involved in it, and I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges for kids is really dealing with the shame and stigma. And, you know, we even know some students who... Um, whose parents were arrested and it, it made the media and then, you know, they had to go to school the next day or the day after and it was just really traumatic because I don't think our schools really have adequate support for kids and, you know, if, if they aren't comfortable opening up about it, then, you know, it just, it, I think it just further feeds into the internalization of, you know, those issues they're having. So what can a mentor do? Like, I, I mean, is that, is that the the sole thing that uh, that Amachi Pittsburgh can do is just yeah. this one-on-one. -on -one. 
Yeah, one on one mentoring is our core service, but we have other um, programs. Um, our youth leadership program is what Kayla runs. It's called Amachi Ambassadors, and it's where she's working with high school students to help them learn um, how to advocate for themselves and how to raise public awareness about this. I mean, they're very comfortable with, um, I think, communicating about the problem and about how it makes them feel and, uh, and about ways that the community can be more helpful. So she's helping to train them um, and they're looking at, well, you can talk a little bit later, I guess, oh, okay. uh, the details of the programs that they're doing a lot of interesting work. Um, but the mentoring is a core service and um, I think what's really important about that is, and, and our goal for our mentors is to, to help kids discover and build their strengths. So it's really just taking a positive approach. Not everybody is going to be skilled to deal with the problem, and we know that, and that's not our expectations of mentors, but um, we feel like everybody can recognize positivity in a child and some potential and help them really discover, um, you know, the things that they do well and, and help them feel better about who they are. And I think understanding um, how to separate you know, your family circumstances from who you are as an individual mm -hmm. is important. And that's, you know, a, a, a real skill that I think every good mentor has. So are your mentors volunteers? Yes. yes. They're all volunteers. How Heck many? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there wouldn't be any. Right. <laughs> right. So how how many do you have? Um, well, we and, have and about you... 110 wow. kids, usually at least 100 kids every year we mentor. And this is all one, I mean, a mentor, does a mentor ever have more than one mm -hmm. child? Yeah. 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 And that ages anywhere from, in terms of who you serve, from very, very young children? Four to 18. Yeah. Four to 18. Mm -hmm. And, and, you should, and, you know, we ask for a one-year commitment, which is, you know, sounds like a lot. But um, I think once uh, the mentor and child form a bond, then it's, you know, you, well, the time flies been... by, right? You don't realize, and then suddenly you're together for three years. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, there's something akin to sort of big brothers, big sisters mm -hmm. here, right? Yeah, right. right? Yeah. 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 Only there's this other element yeah. of the incarcerated parent. Yep, that's mm -hmm. it. Wow. And so you, because of your own experience, you obviously would be the greatest mentor imaginable because you know exactly, I mean, really what a child is feeling. Well, I think that um, being a former mentee in the program and now working there on staff has given me sort of a unique perspective. Um, I've seen the organization grow um, and, and improve because there are services we have now that didn't exist when I was a mentee in the program. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't pretend to know everything about the children we serve. I mean, every story is unique. Yeah. I mean, I was fortunate mm -hmm. enough to have my mother return. Some children's parents are serving life sentences. Mm -hmm. Some parents die in prison. There, I mean, the stories can go on. So I can relate to them on a certain level, but there are still things that I cannot relate to on, on some level with the children. Wow. Yeah, we're always learning. Every situation yeah. is so different really is. I'm sure some just rip your heart uh, out. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so what kind of success? I mean, how do you measure success of a program like this? So we... I mean, I can see a, here's success. <laughs> yeah. But... And and your brother, unfortunately, not. Yeah. So I mean, do you, you you're, you do you, yeah. you judge yourourself? Yeah, I'm we sure. Do. I but, think the best measure of success are the stories, you know, mm -hmm. that we hear from um, you know, our kids like Kayla are adults. <laughs> um, but we do work with the University of Pittsburgh, and we have metrics that we um, have established. And so we look at how kids are faring in school. Um, we look at school attendance, um, suspensions, and their grades, and whether they're progressing from one grade level to the next. Um, we look at, um, you know, how they feel about themselves, how they um, interact with other adults. Um, what other behavioral issues? Mm -hmm. So we look at a number of different criteria. Well, what other? I, my, my sense is, is that um, society uh, is letting down these children in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there'd be no need for Amachi Pittsburgh. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, what kinds of, in your dreams, what kind of support would you like to see schools provide? Um, or 
government provide for these for families and children especially of incarcerated people in your dreams what kind of things should we be doing less incarceration <laughs> yeah that would be okay <laughs> for all right starters, well there we are it's never okay. helpful to be without yeah. your parent there it is both yeah. parents there it is so our for some reason our society has decided that the way to deal with any social issue is simply to criminalize behavior mm-hmm. and throw people in jail. Yeah. And the criminalization really extends to schools with these zero tolerance policies. Yes, exactly that right. Me absolutely not. Exactly right. Yeah. Or when schools don't deal with just, you know, a, a, a students being disruptive in class. It turns out I, more than I realized that schools turn that over to police, police. departments. Yeah. <laughs> For I mean, come insane. on. Yeah. And as young as kindergarten and uh, even preschool, there was a report um, on s- the school district in Maryland that um, I think in one year had about 600 expulsions or suspensions for kids, <laughs> oh, <geez>. babies, <laughs> yeah. you know, in preschool and kindergarten. You know. and, and, and let's be <laughs> perfectly clear here, um, s- re- studies show unequivocally that this kind of, uh, you know, zero tolerance mm-hmm. and criminalizing behaviors and uh, punishment mm-hmm. being the first thing we think about yeah. disproportionately falls on mm-hmm. African-American right. students yeah. and yeah. especially African-American males. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really, you want to talk what's criminal? That's yeah. criminal. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the racial disparities are real. They really are. They're real. And that's one thing what we try to talk about with our ambassadors, to get them to understand the issues that are happening in their school, to get them to think differently about things and have conversations with them about their school. How do you feel about your school environment? Do you feel safe? What do you think about the security or the cops in your school? What do you think about your school having a metal detector? We're just working on um, talking with them and having conversations with them to see and you know, what they could improve about their school. Okay, and so if you, if you, and the effort is to somehow get them to see that they're part of this community and they have a voice, and if they got interested and yeah. Yeah. Think it's actually that they can mm-hmm. maybe affect some change. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so it's empowerment. Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah. Right. And and actually building a youth organizing uh-huh. movement. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she's you know these students that Kayla's training will then go out and recruit other students um, to get involved in school reform. So they're really mm-hmm. exploring ways that they themselves can help to challenge, um, you know, school districts to address these issues differently. And they've come up with some pretty creative ideas. So, yeah. Yeah. so a lot of I saw a, um, a quote from Jess. I mentioned this on the show last week. I forget it was a guy, a New Jersey narc uh, narcotics officer who can't come. Do you remember that I said? I can't remember. See, my brain is so I rely I rely on her young brain. And your young brain is failing me. All right, all right. Well, then we're really in trouble. Okay, it was a narcotics officer who came here to give a speech, and he said that the so-called war on drugs uh-huh. has been. I mean, other than slavery. There has been no other thing more detrimental and truly destructive of African American mm-hmm. families than that. Do you well, agree you with that? Slavery is with only that? illegal in, <laughs> in cases except incarceration. So, well, some people call it modern it's day slavery. Modern day slavery. Yeah. Or I'm reading a book now called um, Oh God, here, here we go again. Uh, the New Jim Crow. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. you know that book. Mm-hmm. And it, too, is about it's so if you take if you do like what we're doing in, in Pennsylvania, right, where the state uh, doesn't uh, give proper funding to the public schools. Right. Mm-hmm. And so in Philadelphia, the uh-huh. school system is in. I mean, it, you don't even you, you don't even know where to start. Yeah. So there's not 
they somehow can't find the proper level of funding and help. But right outside of Philadelphia, you know what they're doing? They're building this huge, huge new prison. <laughs> so yeah. we won't educate them. We'll just wait a little while right. and we'll put them in jail. Mm -hmm. And okay, and then that begets another generation of children in need of your that's, mentors. That's it. Yeah. I mean, we're getting a return on our investment. <laughs> oh, dear <laughs> heavens. Yeah. It really is. Mm -hmm. It's it's unbelievable. Tell you what, I got to take a break. We're going to take a little break, and when we come back, uh, talk more about Amachi Pittsburgh. I bet they could use uh, a few mentors. We'll find out how you can, <laughs> like, maybe sign up, or if you can't do that, how you could send some money. Okay. <laughs> All right, in a minute. <laughs> More is on the way with Lynn Cullen Live. Moments in Black History, brought to you by Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield. Have a greater hand in your health. Josephine Baker began working as a chorus girl while still in grade school. She continued to sing and dance and gained international fame in the American Jazz Review, La Revue Negre. Baker's trademark role was that of Dark Star in the Folie Bergere. Her extravagance was evident on and off stage. Baker owned pet leopards and served as a spy during World War II. Baker also adopted 14 children of various races, which she called her Rainbow Tribe. Unfortunately, she was thrust into financial difficulties and was forced to give up her extravagant lifestyle to pay off her debts. When Josephine Baker died in 1975, she was the first African-American female to receive a 21-gun salute at her I've funeral. I've seen too many of my neighbors affected by stroke, but Highmark is helping us change that by sponsoring our community stroke programs. Caring is a new for Highmark. I know. I've been a member for 40 years. I'm Jerry Ann Allen, and I'm better with glue. We're reinventing affordable health care by keeping the places we call home healthy. It's why our communities are better with Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield. Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield is an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association subject to the terms of your benefit plan. Hi, I'm Dr. John Chips. And I'm Dr. Tim Chips. We have a family dental practice that's been in business for over 35 years. We have two locations in the North Hills. We are in network with most major insurance companies, including United Concordia, Cigna, and UPMC. Find Chips Dental on the web. Remember, Chips Dental. Join One Billion Rising Pittsburgh for a global day of festive resistance to end violence against women. One billion women assaulted and raped worldwide is an atrocity. One billion people dancing to end violence is a revolution. We will rise on V-Day, February 14th, 12 to 2 p.m., Market Square. www.1billionrisingpgh.org. Strike, dance, rise. You're listening to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Once again, here's Lynn Cullen. All righty, welcome back. I'm talking to uh, two women who are uh, helping make the world a better place as opposed to what a lot of the rest of us do, which is just yap. Uh, Anna Hollis is the executive director of Amachi Pittsburgh, and Kayla Boyer was a recipient of their services and now is herself mentoring and uh, running uh, programs for uh, uh, Amachi Pittsburgh, which exists to support and mentor the children of incarcerated parents. All right. Um, you just said to me, somebody said something about, you know, the need for volunteers, huge. Yes. But you said, is it, other than mentors, there mm -hmm. are other opportunities yeah. for volunteering? Oh, yes. Such so as? We have um, other opportunities for volunteers. So we host community events um, with our participants in the program. Um, and these range from different activities like trips to the zoo, museums, um, skating trips. And we need volunteers who are willing to help chaperone, maybe set up for events, help with registration. So those are all opportunities where okay. someone can volunteer. So you don't, if you don't feel like, I don't think I could mentor, I don't know yeah. that I could do that. If you don't that. want to make the one-year commitment, mm -hmm. there are short There are other <laughs> things yeah. that you could you yes. could do. And you said something about uh, jail visitation. What's that? Yes. What? So uh, we have what we call Amachi Saturdays. So on Amachi Saturdays, every first and third Saturday of the month, we go into the Allegheny County Jail. And we play games and make crafts with the children in the Family Activity Center while they're waiting to visit their parent. So they're there for about an hour. They have about an hour wait before their visit. 
And so we want to make that time more mm-hmm. pleasurable yes. instead of mm-hmm. what? Yeah. It's the, I mean, it doesn't look great down there at the jail. <laughs> I mean, the Family Activity Center is great. It's colorful. And when we're there, the kids are happy to see us. We have coloring books, different crafts, and it's just mm-hmm. a, it makes it a better experience when they're going into the jail yeah. to visit their parent. And we could always use volunteers to help us facilitate those craft projects. Okay. My gosh. <laughs> do you remember going to jail to see your mom? I went one doing? time to see my mother. I was uh, probably middle school age, I think. Uh-huh. My grandmother took me down. I remember one time going to see her. And another time when I was younger, I tried to write her a letter. But I'll tell you a funny story really quickly. So I tried to write her a letter, but I was, I was a young child. Um, and I remember writing the letter together with my grandmother. And uh, we put it in an envelope after we wrote the letter. And then I think my grandmother went to probably go get a stamp or maybe a piece of paper that had my mother's DOC number on it. But by the time she came back, I had, I had drawn all over the envelope. And I put <laughs> mom like really big in these Aww. letters. And my grandmother was like, so how are we going to address this? Where are we going to write? <laughs> I don't even know if the, le- the letter ever got You don't know if it sent. ever got sent. <laughs> I was just so excited. I was like, oh, I'm going to make you were this very send. pretty. Just it's send it to my mom. Yeah, it right. said mom. Mom. I, did, I had no That's idea. That's pretty obvious. Yeah. yeah. Well. <laughs> kid. Yeah, you live and you learn. It's yeah. not how you send a letter. <laughs> did the drug war get your mom? <laughs> it did. It did. Yeah, it did. Unfortunately. Well, I, I just, I mean, it's, it's insane. Mm-hmm. Makes you want to tear your hair out. So you would think we'd be getting better, and we're getting worse at this stuff, it seems. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think some states are really being forced to. Um, just be- because of e- economic cost, reasons? Yeah, yeah. It's just out of control. So some states, I think, are really looking at ways to do things differently. In fact, I just took a visit to Seattle um, Washington, and um, it, it's really bad there, but they've come up with this diversion program. So for nonviolent drug-related offenses, um, you know, there's an alternate to uh, To prison. jail. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like, it's that, that, that adage I, I, I just love. If, 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 if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, Everything starts looking like a nail, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like, all right, well, okay, we don't like the way that guy's walking. Right. Jail. All right, you're, you know, drinking yeah. something you shouldn't. Uh, jail. All right. Mm. It was just stupid. Right. And I mean, stupid. there are people who are in cars are arrested repeatedly for the same thing, and it's like it's not working. So we yeah. need to try. Hello. Something yes, it is not working. Yeah. And it's stupid in terms of money, Mm -hmm. too. Unbelievable waste. Unbelievable waste. Um, I had something I wanted to talk about. (laughs) I hate that. Just you wait. You're not old. (laughs) Just you wait. Your head gets so full. Yeah. It might come back to you. Yeah. Oh, no, it will. (laughs) You'll be long gone, but I'm getting... Opportunities Mm -hmm. with the ambassadors? There are other volunteer opportunities. Oh, good. Tell us. um, so as we mentioned before, uh, we have our Amachi Ambassadors Program, which is a youth leadership development program. And this is still a very uh, new learning experience for me as well. And so uh, I'm open to <coughs> working with others who can offer advice or help lead workshops, help facilitate um, sessions with the The kind teens. of skills you're looking for are? Someone who's, who is good at working with teenagers. <laughs> Uh, I'm out. Yes. <laughs> people who know about advocacy yes. okay. work and um, government relations. Okay, so you really, yeah. School education. Mm-hmm. If this is, uh, you know, I'm, seriously, if this is ringing any bells, if not in your own head, you know somebody who would. Mm-hmm. Uh, writing. They do a writing. lot of writing of their I stories. think even social work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think even social workers would be, mm-hmm. would be a good fit, mm-hmm. too. Yeah. So, if people would like to volunteer, the website is Amachi PGH, Amachi PGH dot org, and Amachi is just what you'd expect: A M A C H I, Amachi PGH dot org, and uh, you can find out all kinds of information on the on the website. But so you you rely on um, grants and other uh-huh. things to keep you going, yeah. but y- you do take, I imagine. Oh, yeah. Contributions. 
Okay, yeah. so think of the work that this organization is doing, and think of the fact that behind that work are the faces of young, innocent children whose lives are, whose futures are in jeopardy mm -hmm. in, in many, many ways. And that this is just this one, one little piece of an effort to save those lives. Um, I can't imagine better work than what you guys are doing. So amachipgh.org, A-M-A-C-H-I. And you said you got some big event coming up. You don't want to tell much. Oh, they're, they're very, they're, it's like it's some kind of a, it's a secret or something. But it's got a great name, and the name is? Amachi Hachi Pachi. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, Put in your that? book immediately, Amachi Hachi Pachi. What the heck is that? Yeah. We don't know yet, but no, is it a fundraiser? We're not telling, but it's, it's a it's fundraiser. fundraiser. And it's yeah. a celebration of our 10 years. So you've been, yeah. you've been doing it for 10 years. Yeah. Well, you are one heck of an ambassador. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you are a good mentee. I know you're a good mentor, and you are doing an incredible job, Thank Anna. You. And I'm so glad to have had the opportunity to, uh, to tell people about the work you're doing. So remember it, huh? Amachi, pgh.org, Amachi Pittsburgh. Working in the shadows, nobody knows, nobody sees, and they are helping move things in a positive direction. Too few of us are doing that. If you can help, do it. And have a wonderful day on top of it. I'll be back tomorrow to harangue you further. <laughs> Toodaloo. Lynn Coven Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Coven Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.